Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, nice conference here. And I will be talking about some work that I uh, did together with Thaisa Guyo. She's actually also in the audience with Albrecht Klemm and Hang Yu Ye. So the f motivation for us uh, why we were studying uh, M theory on G2 manifolds is because from a physics point of view, it gives rise to an interesting theory in four dimensions. Namely, it gives rise to a four dimensional low energy effective theory with minimal supersymmetry. While there are also other constructions which lead to that amount of supersymmetry, the nice thing about M theory is that you can actually at least start semi-classically with a unique 11 dimensional action and you can dimensionally reduce this in order to arrive at again a semi-classical uh, description of the resulting low energy theory. Um, however, it comes with some technical challenges because uh, compact seven dimensional G2 manifolds are, are real manifolds and therefore they are difficult to describe. So up until recently, there have not actually been man many examples um, of such uh, geometries. Um, but uh, what I'm going to present you in this talk is how we can use a fairly new construction, namely Kovalev's twisted connected sum construction, to actually get a handle on uh, seven-dimensional G2 manifolds and the resulting effective action. So the nice thing about this construction, which I will review here in this talk, that we can actually use, using this Kovalev construction, techniques of algebraic geometry to, at least in a certain limit, to describe uh, the low energy effective action, and in particular, which will be the focus of this talk, to, uh, uh, to describe certain n equals one gauge theories. Um, so the proposal that I would like to put forward here is that via this gauge theory correspondence, um, we have kind of a, a physics way how we can describe in a controlled way the moduli space or a certain part of the moduli space of such uh, G2 manifolds as we will see. Okay, like I said, uh, M theory on G2 manifolds, it's a, um, uh, it's, it's an interesting theory to study. Nevertheless, this, this list of references, which I hope is, uh, is fairly complete, is actually not too long. So it started with, with Asharya in 96, and there hasn't been too much on the subject. And I think part of the reason is because it's really difficult um, to, to analyze these manifolds or to have explicit examples. More recently, in the physics literature, there has been um, um, uh, well, new interest in these precisely because of this uh, twisted connected sum construction and this was also for us a motivation to take a stab at these uh, G2 manifolds. I should say in the math literature this is not meant to be a complete list of uh, references. I just put here those references which were for me or for us important to learn the subject and uh, down here are the references which are important uh, in, in developing the Kovalev's twisted con sum construction which started with the original paper in uh, 2000, but there has been uh, tremendous progress since then due to these uh, works by Corti and all, uh, Crowley, Nordstrom, and Hatskin, and so on and so forth. Okay. So let me get started, and uh, that we are all on the same page. So let me uh, briefly tell you what G2 manifolds are. Well, these are compact, real, uh, compact, real seven-dimensional Riemannian form manifolds with a metric G, and. Um, the, the metric G is richly flat and the corresponding holonomy of the induced levi civita connection is, is G2. And for me, it's not gonna, it's gonna, the holonomy is going to be precisely G2 and not a subgroup thereof. So there's actually a useful equivalent description, which is useful from the geometry point of view, but also from the physics point of view, that we can alternatively describe such manifolds in terms of uh, what is called a torsion-free G2 structure. So that's a certain three-form with a certain positivity condition, which is closed. And then from the three-form, you can reconstruct a metric and now, uh, with respect to that induced metric, it's also co-closed. So if you have such a torsion-free G2 structure which fulfills this equation, then uh, this is equivalent of having that Ritchie flat metric. I should say this is a highly nonlinear equation because uh, uh, this, this co-closedness condition because the, the, the metric is constructed nonlinearly from this from the three form. So what is also useful that some things are known about the moduli spaces of the such G2 manifolds, namely in particular, if we start with such a torsion-free G2 structure, we can perturb it infinitesimally by harmonic forms. 
uh, uh, to describe an infinitesimal deformation. And actually, these infinitesimal uh, deformations by ha um, how many forms are also unobstructed at finite order. So hence, we, we know that the dimension of the moduli space at the generic point is going to be P3, the third Betty number of the, of the G2 manifold. It's unobstructed. Oh, did I say obstructed? Yeah, it's unobstructed, yeah. So about the global properties of the moduli space, there's not uh, that much known. In particular, the map. So as you see, this, this torsion-free G2 structure is closed. So hence, I can interpret this also as a cohomology element. So for instance, this global map from, uh, from the moduli space into the cohomology uh, is typically not known. And in particular, it's, uh, it's an interesting question how many pre-images you have for a certain cohomology element of H3 giving rise to a torsion-free G2 structure obeying these differential equations. So let me now review something, uh, something else. Um, so if we have now such a G2 manifold, we can actually say something about the effective theory, at least semi-classically. And this goes back to some interesting work by Beasley and Witten in 2002. So essentially, uh, first of all, we, we can say something about the spectrum. So the spectrum is given by the non-trivial Betten numbers in this, uh, in this G2 manifold. B3 is going to give us the, the number of chiral multiplets in that theory, and B2 is going to give us the number of vector multiplets in this theory. And then we can derive the low-dimensional semi-classical effective action by first specifying the, the complex structure on the, uh, on the moduli space of these Karl multiplets. This is given by uh, complexifying that torsion-free G2 structure with the M theory 3 form. This gives good chiral coordinates. And then the Kahler potential in terms of these Kahler coordinates uh, you can write in terms of uh, this, this following functional, which is also called, called the Hitchin functional. And similarly, we can express in the version of background fluxes the superpotential and the gauge kinetic coupling function, which are linear in this Kahler multiplet semi-classically. So this is the data that you need to specify if you want to describe the uh, resulting four-dimensional effective theory. And what we will do now next is we will now uh, go to this uh, special class of G2 manifolds and revisit how these, uh, how these uh, functions look like in this geometry. So let me uh, now get to some geometry and to the, to the basic idea what Kovalov's construction, uh, so how it actually works. So if you want a seven-dimensional manifold which has G2 holonomy, one starting point that you can think of start with a Calabria threefold which has SU3 holonomy, then tensor it with an additional circle, then you get a seven-dimensional manifold, and, uh, uh, but you still have SU3 holonomy, which is a subgroup of G2. So now the idea is to, to it, do it with uh, two Calabria manifolds, tensor it with an S1, and maybe clue it together in, in a certain twisted way such that the whole space is going to have uh, G2 holonomy. And the precise recipe how to do this is you, you take what is called an asymptotically cylindrical Calabria threefold. So it has an asymptotic region where uh, the Calabria threefold looks like uh, a, a K3 surface S times, times an S1 or times a cylinder times an S1 in an interval. And then it has a region where it's capped off by some, some compact piece. And now if you take two of such asymptotic cylindrical Calabria threefolds, the, the basic idea is now to, to identify suitably to identify these, these K3 surfaces and also that to identify this S1 which you get from the asymptotic end with the S1 that you, uh, that you tensored with, uh, uh, that you took the Cartesian product with of the other space. And here you do the same thing. And now if you do this identification properly, you can show that, uh, that uh, actually you, you, get, uh, you get G2 manifolds, which is now a certain cluing of two such, two such spaces. Okay, let me first uh, get to asymptotically cylindrical Calabria threefold, and this is where we actually make contact with classical algebraic geometry. Um, so, so there is a very nice construction how you can get those. So you start with a weak final threefold, so in other words, the, uh, you have so a certain positivity condition on the anti-canonical bundle. You pick two generic uh, anti-canonical sections, which uh, they intersect in a, if you choose them to be generic, they intersect in a smooth curve. And now um, if you blow up this, uh, this, this, this funnel or weak funnel threefold along this curve, then the proper transform of these, these sections generate for you a, a, a base point three pencil. So hence, uh, if you take a look at this flow up, what you actually get here is a K3 vibration over some base P1. And now an, an, an important theorem by 
in this in this work by Cort and all now tells us that if you now take out a fiber of this K3 vibration, um, then then this space here uh, Z minus this fiber X actually admits an asymptotically syndromic Calabi-R threefold metric. Okay. So instead of, uh, instead of working with these complicated objects, these asymptotic cylindrical Calabria threefold metric, um, at least as long as we are just interested in algebraic information, um, we equivalently now take what is sometimes called in the literature a building block, this pair of this blown up space together with the fiber that we, we are going to take out. And I should say the vicinity of this, uh, this fiber that we are taking out is going to be precisely this asymptotic region that I had in this cartoon before. Uh, so the Calabiao metric along this, uh, in the vicinity of that fiber which we take out, actually takes uh, asymptotically approaches the Calabiao metric of a K3 times an S1 or times a times the cylindrical piece. Whether the the the, the device is at infinite distance, yeah, that is right. Okay, but in this construction. Um, uh, yes, so, so this is an infinite distance, so we, we cap it, if you want to clue it together, you cap it off as a finite distance. So hence, actually, I'm closing over this point, you will have some correction terms to this, uh, to this metric of uh, the K3 surface times an S1 in the region where we are cluing these things. They are exponentially suppressed, that is right. Okay, so now what we need to fulfill here is, uh, uh, is the, match, the, oops, the matching condition. So the matching condition uh, in Kovalev's construction uh, can be formulated Hodge theoretically. So if you now take this K3 surfaces, which we have uh, in, in this asymptotic region, then we need to identify... So the K3 surfaces, by the way, are polarized. They're polarized because they induce a Kähler structure from, from this color BL. So if you take those, they need to be identified in the following fashion. The Kähler form on the left needs to be the real part of uh, the polarized K3 surface on, uh, uh, of the holomorphic 3 0 form on the right, and similarly the holomorphic 2 0 form on the left uh, arises from this, this following uh, combination. So if you now have formulated the such theoretical statement, we can now go ahead and try to, uh, try to carry out this cluing. So I will not really explain it, but there is uh, also in this paper quote it all, they present a particular recipe which is called orthogonal cluing, which you can actually apply uh, algorithmically. So the essential idea is in order to, to, uh, to achieve this, this, this Hodge theoretical condition, we use Torellis theorem to actually um, uh, uh, find two matching K3 surfaces in the moduli space of these polarized K3 surfaces. And then if you have a matching K3 surfaces, uh, the question is, can we actually uh, uh, approach these uh, K3 surfaces in this vibration, um, uh, in this construction that I had on the previous slide? And Beauville's theorem essentially tells you that uh, under certain conditions that you impose on this, uh, on the, the, the threefold that I started with, the, the precise condition is semifano. If you have a matching uh, condition of the K3 surfaces, then this ensures, uh, um, if you have the semifano condition, that you can actually find this matching pair also in the moduli space of the asymptotic cylindrical Calabi-R threefolds. And once we have done these two steps, uh, we, we can now construct a G2 manifold out of, uh, out of uh, such, such two building blocks. So these are, uh, th there's actually uh, an, a nice classification of semi-final threefolds, at least in the Tory case, they have been classified. In general, they have not been classified. Well, there's also um, a, a more special class that has been classified as one of fields. This is the Mui Mukai transformation. And uh, you can also construct asymptotic cylindric calabias of weak fanos, but uh, the orthogonal cluing or how to address the matching condition is a bit, bit more subtle. But I think there's interesting physics involved in working, in working this out here. Okay, so now what we can do is we can now uh, go ahead and take back, uh, take a look again at the four-dimensional effective theory. So now we have this, this, this cluing construction and now what you can do is you can actually now um, by some um, chasing sequences uh, of, uh, for, uh, arising from the long exact sequence of the short exact Maya Via Torres uh, sequence that you get from the cluing, you can work out what the, what the spectrum of the theory is. And what you will find is that there's always a universal modulus, the volume modulus, obviously, but there's another universal modulus, it's the cluing modulus, which parameterizes how far we out we go in the asymptotic region, and we call, call that modulus the Kovalev ton. And then there are further non-universal non moduli, which I call S. 
So now in this region where we are, uh, where we, uh, in the limit where we do the cluing um, uh, far out, then uh, the, 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 the Kahler potential actually takes the simple form, which depends on these two moduli, and then there's a non-universal piece which you can in principle calculate um, uh, uh, for, for these non-universal moduli, but they are moduli dependent. And then there, there will be corrections, further corrections to this, uh, which, are, uh, which, which, which vanish as we take this Kovalev term to infinity. So if you do the cluing far in infinity, then these corrections uh, will vanish and they are suppressed. So you can also compute the number of vector multiplets in this theory, and let me maybe uh, point out a bit this formula. So it depends on two U1 factors um, uh, coming from the left and right geometry. So, uh, so these U1 factors, you should think of, of two forms that are in this compact part of the asymptotic region, which are, however, in the kernel once you restrict them to the asymptotic region. So they're in the kernel on the two-form cohomology of this uh, K3 surfaces. So they are coming some two forms from the left and from the right. And then there are further two forms which come from the intersection of the two Picard lattice and left and then right, which you can attribute to the, uh, to the asymptotic region or to the K3 surface. So this brings me actually now to, this, uh, to, the, to the gauge theory sectors that we have in this theory. So naively, if you take a look at this uh, cartoon picture again, so in this part here and that part, we have uh, locally uh, an approximately SU3 holonomy. So if you take a look at the spectrum uh, which you get from these U1 theories that I just pointed out, which come from the left and from the right, then you will find that there's actually always a, a, a chiral field associated to that. So since we have SU3 holonomy, which is a subgroup of G2, we expect also in the, in the gauge theory an additional symmetry, and the additional symmetry that you have is that actually uh, the theory, at least in the strict limit, becomes an N equals 2 gauge theory, and uh, the multiplets assemble into N equals 2 uh, multiplets. So the same for the right. And then there is um, an, a further symmetry enhancement if you're in the middle. So locally, again, approximately you have uh, an SU2 holonomy. So indeed, uh, again, if you take this strict Kovalev limit, then you will see that additional modes in this case become massless and they assemble into an N equals 4 multiplet. So in the remaining time, I will focus on such an N equals uh, 2 theory and actually about the non-abelian version of this. Uh, that, that is right. Yeah, so there, if you want, there, uh, yes, so, so you have two n equals to two theories which are, which are separated, and if you want, they're gravi gravitationally coupled, but not in the, in the gauge theory. Okay, so, um, so, so let me come to, to non abelian uh, gauge theories that we can get in such a uh, construction, and uh, there were some proposals and some s specific models already is in this uh, interesting work by Dave Morrison and Jim Halverson. So we now systematically study, uh, study the ar uh, arising of non-abelian gauge theories in such geometries. So what can you do? Is, uh, so you take now this, this threefold that we started from, and let's, let's assume that this anti canonical bundle actually factorizes uh, into um, a bunch of line bundles, where again these line bundles um, uh, have some positivity or some ampleness condition, such that they have global sections, and such that we can write an anti-canonical section in this, in this factorized form. Now we perform the same blow-up that we have done before, but now we don't have a, a, a smooth curve anymore, but the blow-up formula degenerates to the following, and what you will see is that um, as we start setting uh, A1 and S1 equal to zero and one of these factors to zero, we get actually get AK singularities. And the gauge group that you get from such a geometry is the following non-abelian gauge group, a bunch of U, uh, SU2 factors and a bunch of U1 factors. Furthermore, uh, we get, uh, we get um, actually um, the following structure of the, of the matter spectrum, which takes the following form. Well, we have the n equals 2 vector multiplets, which you can also represent in n equals 1 multiplets. And we get some adjoint multiplets, uh, which are enumerated by the genus of these curve components, and we get some hypermultiplets, which essentially come from the intersections of these, of these curves. Okay, but if you have such an n equals 2, 2 theory, we can actually uh, now study uh, the, the branches of these, uh, of these gauge theories. So it has a Higgs branch and it has a Coulomb branch, and actually we can compute the dimension of the Higgs and the Coulomb branch. Um, so this is actually an n equals two Higgs branch and an n equals two Coulomb branch. So in an n equals long and uh, in an n equals one language, it would be uh, both n equals one Higgs branches. So the Higgs branch is that uh, the the 
uh, we give an expectation value to one of the hypermultiplets, whereas the, the Coulomb branches, we give an expectation value to one of the chiral fields which you want, which sits in the n equals two uh, vector multiplets. This is a true G2 manifold, so, so what happens is if, you, if the Kovalev ton is finite, the spectrum nevertheless of these gauge theory sectors is n equals 2, but the couplings in general will not respect the n equals 2 supersymmetry. There will be corrections, exponential suppressed corrections in this, in this modulus, which... Uh, yes. Well, there are different n equals two theories. That is right. Yes, that is right. Sorry, D. Well, uh, okay. So, so if you send the Kovalev term strictly to infinity, uh, we we decouple we decouple gravity, and we are left with an n equals two sector. For finite Kovalev term, you get exponential suppressed couplings. We will not respect the n equals two. Sim Sorry. Yes. Yes. Um, um, okay. So this is a. Uh, okay. Maybe we can discuss that. Well. Okay. Um, I'm running short of time here. Anyway, you, you compute the dimension of a Higgs branch and the dimension of a Coulomb branch. And now what you can do is, uh, you, you, we actually have a geometric way of, uh, of uh, also describing these two branches. One is given by a deformation of the anticanonical section, and the other is by the res resolution of the anticanonical section. And what we can now do is, we can uh, construct corresponding G2 manifolds uh, for, uh, for both phases. Um, Okay, but now we can actually make a prediction from the gauge theory. We can make a prediction how the Betty numbers of the G2 manifold from this transition from the Higgs to the Coulomb branch uh, should change according to the dimension, of, for instance, here the number of uh, hypermultiplets in an n equals 2 language or the corresponding uh, dimensions of in terms of the curls should match accor ac according to this formula here. And actually, if you now again compute in these two geometric phases uh, the, the Betty numbers, what you will find is that this change in Betty numbers actually agrees with the geometry. Now, this is uh, coming back to uh, uh, Greg's question. So in general, since it's an n equals 1 theory, we do not expect that, uh, that there are uh, any flat directions at all because everything should be lifted. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this, this transition that we are describing is in the same sense um, a semi-classical moduli space as you have uh, these moduli space of G2 manifolds in general. If we, uh, it would be interesting to actually compute those quantum corrections or the quantum moduli spaces in there indeed. Uh, coming back to your question, we expect that everything in principle is lifted. But nevertheless, on the classical level, there is uh, in the moduli space of the G2 manifolds, the singularity is there at finite distance and we expect that there's a classical transition among the corresponding G2 manifolds. Uh, so I'm actually running, ru running out of time here. So let me just say that you can now study various examples. And uh, uh, this is, for instance, based on a, on a rank 2 final uh, threefold. And you can now uh, discuss the various possibilities how you can uh, degenerate an anticanonical section. So in a, in a physics language, this corresponds to mixed Higgs Coulomb branches in an angle of one language. And to each branch, you can associate a G2 manifold. And also the change of dimensions and the change of Batty numbers uh, changes as, uh, as you'd expect. So maybe let me come uh, to the conclusions. Um, so I've tried to explain to you that um, the, the, the Kovalev construction is actually an interesting, well, it's, it's a very special type of G2 manifolds, but nevertheless, it's an interesting construction because it allows you to use techniques of uh, algebraic geometry, like intersection theory, variation of hot structure techniques, to actually derive semi-classical terms in the effective action. I try to uh, tell you that um, we have a conjecture, at least about the classical moduli spaces, how one can use uh, gauge theory techniques to connect various moduli spaces of G2 manifolds. And, okay, it would be interesting to generalize these things. What about chiral spectrum, since we have uh, gauge theories with, which, which always have fall into n equals two multiplets, how to achieve this? Uh, that's something that we are currently looking at. There's a story about going beyond Semifano. Uh, so in the F-theory community, there are these unhexable clusters which are discussed uh, extensively. Uh, so it seems that going beyond Semifano gives rise to uh, such unhexable clusters. And 
Uh, an interesting question would be, what about non-perturbative superpotential interactions coming from N2 brain instantons? Uh, can we maybe, in this special class of geometries, also use uh, the underlying color BO structure to maybe enumerate some of these? That would be an interesting question. So let me stop here. <laughs>